So, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, we're really delighted to be able to welcome the President of Estonia, Thomas Ilves, here this afternoon, together with uh, Professor Giuliano Mato. Uh, we're, we've, we've planned this, uh, we've just been talking about how we're going to plan this debate, this discussion, and both of them are very keen that this should be very, uh, a lively and open discussion with everybody in the room. So we hope we'll structure it in, in this way. But let me first of all um, introduce uh, to you uh, Professor Ilves, first of all, who, uh, sorry, no, say it again. Professor. No. no. President. No, well, not a professor. Pro you could be a professor. No, okay. I President think. Ilves, yes. Um, who, well, you've been a teacher, including university, uh, university teacher, um, has been president of Estonia since 2006. Before that, he was uh, foreign minister twice and uh, also a member of the European Parliament. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm keeping the introductions very short because I think we should really get into the discussion, and I'm sure you will. Uh, you will all agree with me about that. Um, uh, Giuliano Amato, who is a professor, I'm allowed to call you a professor as well as a president, Giuliano, um, who is, uh, has, has been uh, a, a professor here at the EUI, is now Professor Emeritus in the Law Department of the, of the EUI, but he's also the, the president of the Scuola Sant'Anna in Pisa, um, and has in the past, of course, uh, been uh, served in the, uh, in the Italian government both as, as Minister of the Interior, as Deputy Prime Minister, and twice as Prime Minister. Uh, he was also uh, Vice President of the Convention on the Future of Europe, um, and I think in, 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 in that uh, context, uh, and in others, has, has for many years been uh, thinking and talking and writing about uh, the direction in which Europe might go, uh, and in particular the European Union. So the way that we're going to uh, structure the debate now is that we, we will have a little bit of a, of a ping pong. Um, uh, President Ilves is going to start um, with some, uh, some ideas uh, that he has, at which uh, uh, Professor Amato will respond to, and then I'll open up that uh, discussion for comments and, and, and questions and discussions, and then we'll move on to another theme. So we have a number of themes uh, which we're going to cover uh, during the course of the afternoon. Um, okay, I think uh, we, should, uh, we should make a start. So would you like to kick off? I thought you were going to ask me a question. No. <laughs> you kick off okay. with your first... Uh, there was in the uh, in the Soviet times in my country. There was a the Komsomol newspaper had a rubric called uh, "I will ask and I will answer." So I guess I have to ask my own question. Um, well, what I wanted to talk about first, uh, I mean, of the general themes, was actually um, one of the dilemmas uh, that uh, a country like mine faces in the uh, the whole sort of euro. Uh, mess that we have right now. Uh, we are the most recent and also the poorest member of the uh, of the of the Euro 17. Uh, we are a very committed pro-European country and have been and very integrationist. I would say one of the most, and we have one of the highest approval ratings of the European Union in the European Union. The problem comes in is that uh, Estonia. Mm, is, um, well, I mean, its uh, policies have been, uh, have been um, very, very, uh, what can I say, Lutheran. When we agree to something, we do it. Um, for us, uh, the, you negotiate to get to a contract, but when you have the contract, you fulfill it. So, and probably one of the most uh, rigid contracts that we have uh, had to deal with uh, is the, are the Maastricht criteria, or now, once we're in the Stability and Growth Pact, 
So, I mean, the result is that my country has, um, we have under 7% state debt. And this year we have a budget surplus. That is, we don't have a deficit. Um, and, um, I mean, this, and this is a result of very difficult policies. Uh, we went through a period in which we actually cut senior government salaries 20%, other government salaries 10%, um, all to deal with the economic crisis. Presidential salary? Of course. How much? 10%. Good. That was Just to know. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not very high to begin with. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, I mean, by your standards, I mean, it's not very high. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, the Italian Senate standards, it's really, okay. <laughs> it's not even, well, never mind, we'll get into that. But anyway, uh, so, uh, so here we are, and we're, as I said, the, very, very strict uh, about expenditures, and then, uh, first with uh, ESFS and then later with ESM, you know, we have to support a country, we have to bail out countries, a country, several countries, that are far richer than we are, that have not followed the rules. Um, I mean, the most, uh, I mean, the most difficult case, if actually, uh, which is, uh, I mean, it was brought up by some of the uh, less than enthusiastic uh, people regarding EUs, that uh, the average, average salary in Estonia is 10% below the minimum wage in Greece. That's not taking into account 13 and 14th month salaries, which we don't have. The, uh, the uh, average pension is three and a half times higher in Greece than in Estonia. And uh, the retirement age for civil servants is 63, 64, as opposed to 50. Now, this is, this, is the, this is the reality on the ground with which our parliament has to, uh, has to pass these two measures. Uh, in both cases, we basically got 75% of the parliament in favor, including the opposition, which was, consists of a very pro-European party that I used to head, the Social Democrats. After these votes, we had a, uh, the, the newspapers published opinion polls, and 75% of the populace was completely against any kind of uh, any kind of bailout. Now, here we, when we talk about you know, democratic legitimacy in the European Union, basically what we have is a parliament, democratically elected parliament, that is doing what, from a European point of view, is the right thing but which is also, the closer we get to the next election, more and more suicidal. Now, what do we do? I mean, that's the dilemma that we face. And, uh, and I think that, uh, so when, we, when I read the press, I mean, I see a lot of sort of, uh, I see lots of attacks on Germany. I see not only from Europe, but you know, you see in the United States, the, why doesn't you know, Merkel do this? Why doesn't Merkel do that? And I, I'm always perplexed because, I mean, if she did any of the things that she's being asked to do, she would be, I mean, she would lose her, I mean, the, the, the government coalition would fire her. Uh, you know, it's, and people act as if uh, Germany today is kind of, um, well, an authoritarian country of the kind that has, um, you know, an, I mean, basically, you can make decisions that you make in China that, you know, okay, well, now we decide to do this. Unfortunately, again, here's a question of democratic legitimacy in the European Union, which is different from the question of democratic legitimacy when people say, why is the Troika coming here and, here and telling us that we have to uh, liberalize our, liberalize our uh, employment uh, or sort of... So, so I mean, I'm honored to say this to bring in the understanding that democratic legitimacy is not simply a matter of so-called Brussels or the Troika dictating to a country that has broken the rules and consistently, or to countries that have consistently broken the rules. That may be an issue of democratic legitimacy. I think there's a far more dangerous issue of democratic legitimacy that involves countries that are doing the right things that, uh, for, for moving out of this mess without really 
genuine public support in their own countries. In my country, in Germany, uh, in the Netherlands, in Finland, um, you, have, you have parties that are very anti-EU, that have done well in, uh, in elections, um, and have severely affected domestic politics. I mean, <clears throat> if you look at the coalition in Finland today, it's a coalition of very disparate parties uh, on the political spectrum, united really only by their pro-Europeanists. That's all they have in common. Otherwise, you know, from the communists to the, to the conservatives and the uh, Swedish People's Party, you have parties that, in fact, have nothing in common except for they are willing to stand up for Europe. And this, I mean, this you can see in other countries as well. I was heartened by the results of the election in uh, the Netherlands recently, which in fact showed that people are willing to come along with, uh, with uh, pro-European policies because uh, Gert Wilders really lost a, by a lot compared to his earlier vote. But I mean, this issue of democratic legitimacy, which keeps coming up and up in regar uh, regarding the um, regarding the behavior of the Troika or the actions of the Troika, regarding the demands, so-called demands made by Brussels, is far more complex. And I rarely see anyone looking at the issue of democratic legitimacy on the part of the countries that are going along um, in supporting Europe, and more importantly, that uh, especially those countries that have followed the rules, have, have, have done what they should do, uh, and now, because they're in a better position than the countries that didn't do, are in fact helping bail out the countries that didn't follow the rules. And the especially difficult problem of a country like mine, in which we're ultimately bailing out people far richer than we are. But you, you were saying that, that, that this was nevertheless the right thing to do. Well, we're very pro European. I mean, we think that, well, I mean, if, it's, uh, if that's the if that's the price of uh, being European, uh, I mean, it's, uh, uh, we'll do it. But I mean, again, uh, we're fortunate in that we have, as of yet, uh, no serious uh, sort of anti-EU populist party in, uh, in Estonia, the kind that you see in many, many countries today. Um, but that, I, I'm not sure that's going to last. <laughs> I mean. I mean, if, it's, if there's an issue there that doesn't have a real champion uh, in the public domain, someone's going to pick it up and they, because they can see that with this they can get a lot of votes. Mm -hmm. Juliana, do you want to? Yes, uh, we have to thank you, Thomas, because you're giving us an evidence that is badly needed and that we uh, didn't think of. Uh, uh, previously thinking of the, uh, let's say, <clears throat> conflict that has been somehow increasing and increasing between the rich ones of the north and the poorer ones of the south. You are now <clears throat> pointing at something that is even more dangerous the conflict between the poor of the North and the less poor of the South that need the aid of the poor of the North. A new source of tension and hostility, potential hostility, potential hostility inside the European Union, the Eurozone, that is leading us more toward disruption than toward the integration we say all of us want. And of course, you only have an argument to convince your fellow citizens that might get convinced for some time, but not forever, the price of being Europeans, as you said. And so, we understand that the single currency, which was supposed to be single and was named single, has to uh, uh, rely upon policies that are not single. 
Uh, we are forced to enter into the main topic of our debate, Thomas, since the beginning, unavoidably. Because, of course, it was supposed to be the single currency. We read that it is a common good, uh, was st the stability of which uh, depend uh, on correct conduct by all the members of the community that share it as a common good. And therefore, necessarily, I have to remedy, to find the remedy to the uh, uh, side effects of the misconduct of some of the members of the community, not because of solidarity, necessarily, but because I have to defend the common good I share. And therefore it is on my own interest that I have to do these things. The damned Greeks uh, are doing what they are doing, but I have to, uh, 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 let's say, uh, give my piece of, uh, of remedy Otherwise, not Greece only, but the euro uh, might be disrupted. This is the argument. It's very much rational, but in my view, it can't work, as you rightly said, uh, uh, when the price uh, is high and when the comparison is not convincing. When the compar we have seen how the visibility of unjustified inequalities can play an enormous role in moving people, Arab Spring. But there might be uh, movements also inside our European Union and after a while people might say, no, I'm not ready to pay this price anymore because it is unfair, full stop. And what will we do at that point? We are still on time, therefore, and at the moment I will make it short because we will go back to this uh, 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 crucial topic later on in our discussion. But necessarily I have to think that what is emerging now is beyond any reasonable doubt that the decisions adopted with the Maastricht Treaty to rely upon intergovernmental coordination to create the necessary uh, convergence of policies uh, uh, as the necessary platform for, for the euro was a tragic mistake. Uh, even more tragic and even more mistake because we had been warned that it could not work. Uh, I was rereading days ago one of the books by Tommaso Padua Schioppa on the long road to the Euro. And one of the essays published in that book was quoting the uh, 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 opinions uh, mostly of economists of the time of Maastricht, 91, 92, in which they were saying uh, uh, it, it can't work because uh, should you face an asymmetric shock, you would need centralized instruments a, 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 a toolbox at the supranational level in order to counterbalance these shocks. So don't expect the single currency to work having only monetary policy as single policy and relying on a coordination of, of national policies. You won't make it. We decided that we uh, uh, could make it for the simple reason that we did not want to transfer national prerogatives and responsibilities to the European level. We wanted to defend our national leeway in these matters. And now, history is 
taking its revenge uh, 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 upon us quite, quite clearly. Now, it, it, it has not worked. It has not worked, but it's, it's even worse because something that we had not realized at the time is that, let's say, the intangible that have to stay below institutional constructions would have changed under our eyes, independently of our will. We needed solidarity. We needed mutual trust under the European construction, under the Euro. And by this kind of intergovernmental texture, we were creating the underpinnings of, uh, of mutual hostility. Why? Because whatever is being decided, uh, intergovernmental coordination, as you know, was uh, defined soft law. I wrote after a while, and nobody could challenge my opinion, that for sure it was, sometimes, for sure it was uh, 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 soft, uh, but it was not law at all. So it was just soft, and uh, uh, it was immediately broken up by France and Germany as uh, as, as we know, and divergences uh, became even more deeper, even more deeper after we adopted the euro for e economic and financial reasons that I don't have the time to, to go e into now. But my point here is, and I stop with it, Maurice, is that when things started going wrong, we had built this kind of framework and we could only dig into this framework and therefore it remained intergovernmental coordination but instead of remaining soft, we tried to make it hard. In other words, making recommendations, proposals, indications binding. How was it taken by our public opinions? Not that there is a Europe deciding something upon all of us, but the other ones deciding what I have to do. And immediately the problem, not by chance of democratic legitimacy, was going toward national parliaments. It doesn't make any sense if you think that where these European policies, why should you look for democratic legitimacy in your national parliaments? You should look for it somewhere else. But quite rightly, people realize that this is Germany that wants me to do this. But my parliament decides what I have to do, not, not, not Germany. And at the same time in Germany and in Estonia, people think, why should I put my money for them? They are forcing me to use my money to pay their bill. And they have gone to the restaurant, not me. Why should I pay? So uh, by making this intergovernmental texture as binding as possible, we have somehow destroyed the necessary intangibles for our construction. Uh, uh, you know where I, I, I go, that only now it's time for us to federalize this construction because we have the opportunity to, t to tell our people it's better for you. This Europe is damaging you and is damaging itself. But there is a better Europe that we can build together that will make you more free. Also free to go bankrupt without me being forced to pay for you because uh, the easy conclusion of this kind of argument is, after all, California can freely, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, get bankrupt and the dollar is safe. Greece cannot without affecting the euro. This is the main point and the reason of our difficulty.
I just want to add a brief footnote. I mean, I am president of Estonia, so I talk about my country, but actually, what is rarely recalled that the first casualty of the Euro crisis was the legitimately democratically elected government of Slovakia, that which, where Mrs. Zaritsova took the right step and said she would support EFSF. But the cost of that was, in order to get the vote through the Slovak parliament, the opposition said, we will support you if you resign. And she did that. And she did. Mm -hmm. And I mean, so she voluntarily resigned her government in order to get the opposition to support her. Now, I mean, so the first casualty of, of the Euro crisis was not a country that had a hard time financially. They, Slovakia was doing great. <laughs> Uh, but Slovakia did the right thing. Mrs. Radicova did the right thing. She resigned. And so when I hear about, oh, this is, this is, you know, these governments are going to be falling. Well, in fact, who was the first government to fall? And we forget that. And I think actually Mrs. Radicova should be held, I mean, should be really uh, sort of held up as a, as a real European who basically fell on her sword in order to help. To help. Yeah. Thank you very much. I have a question to both of you. A first question. I'm professor in the law department, currently emeritus professor. I'm not a monetary expert. Uh, first question. Uh, democracy can work only as long as the citizens can understand pol policy making. That is, as long as citizens can have trust that there is rule of law, that the rules adopted by parliaments are respected. So the first question to you, President Ilves, would be, do you think the fact that 23 out of 27 EU member states no, did not respect the agreed fiscal disciplines, the agreed debt disciplines, the agreed convergence, economic convergence disciplines in the Lisbon Treaty, do you perceive this as a rule of law crisis? Or do you share the view of some members of the European Parliament, of some uh, national politicians, that all these rules in Article, what is it, 218, I think, are only soft rules and this is not a rule of law crisis. And the question to Professor Amato uh, would be, you say that a, a single European monetary union with a single monetary policy but without a single economic policy cannot work. That was, I think, your message. But we have had centuries in Europe of a single currency or of parallel currency systems based on the gold standard and the, and the silver standard without any common economic policy. So, uh, of course, uh, the uh, euro uh, governance crisis reflects governance failures at the EU level, but wouldn't you uh, share the view that as long as economic policies, fiscal policies, debt policies, labor market policies, social policies are primarily national policies under the Lisbon Treaty, that the primary governance failures have been at the national level in Greece, for example, or in Portugal. And if you then ask to what extent do we need additional federal remedies, and we certainly need them, uh, but do you really have to go so far to aim at a single economic policy in the European Union? Can you really believe that the governance failures in Greece, the lack of an effective tax system, for example, can be remedied from Brussels? Can you really believe that the corruption in Greece can be remedied from Brussels? So here I think the national politicians in Greece, in Italy, in Spain and Portugal, have a tendency to blame others Germany and uh, other EU countries for their own governance failures. And I think we should be a little bit more explicit to what extent should we now federalize the, uh, uh, the economic policies. Of course we need probably a banking union. Of course we need additional disciplines as in the fiscal compact. But I think we should be a little bit more specific to what extent 
we need additional disciplines at the national level to avoid and to limit national governance failures, which seem to be abundant in many EU member countries. Uh, Lette Roths, uh, Tallinn Law School, I'm uh, head of the public chair. And I have a question to uh, Thomas Henrik Gilles about the de democratic legitimacy and, uh, and our Estonian concerns about uh, joining um, the European Stability Mechanism. And uh, I, my concern is, uh, you were talking about that, yeah, we are needing and we are lacking and etc. And I would like to know your opinion about what you think that our Estonian um, decision to, to support it, was it uh, enough democratic? Um, because as you mentioned also, that most of Estonians actually didn't support this idea. And um, I think also to add to this to discussion, our state chancellor opposed the decision to, um, to join by pointing out the constitutional concerns of, uh, of joining uh, the agreement. So what is your opinion about that? Estonian. Not quite. It was, uh, I mean... Legal the, Sorry, yes, legal tension. Well, that was joining ESM. I mean, we are a member of the Eurozone. And it was, he took it to court, and the court ruled in favor of, uh, I mean, against him. Um, Please, yeah. Well, on the first question, I mean... Uh, well, there really is a difference, uh, a sort of historical cultural difference between uh, sort of societies in terms of their approach to law. Uh, you know, we were, uh, you know, in spite of whoever ruled us, we basically had Lübeck Recht ever since uh, 1275, yes? 1275, yes. I have a story in there. Uh, so, uh, I mean, and especially if you were an Estonian peasant, if you didn't follow the rules, you basically you had 40 lashes. So, I mean, we end up sort of, uh, um, I mean, so we sort of think that if, it's, if the rules are there, you follow them. And indeed, there are places where you think the rules perhaps provide an interesting guideline, but being, sticking to them is not uh, necessary. Um, but we, our psychology is that if the rules are there, and as I said, the whole pro the, for us the process of getting to the rules is important. You negotiate them, but once they are agreed to, then we assume. I mean, that's contract law, torts. I mean, that's the way it works. Um, and so, I mean, that is a problem. If people think th the same words mean different things, or the, sa or the same laws have uh, uh, have different uh, enforceability or, 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 sh or should be, in fact, voluntarily followed. And I think that is a problem. Uh, I don't know what the remedy is, but certainly, you know, we, we sort of, where are these peasants? And if it says you have to do this, then we follow that. And it says if you do that, that will happen. We believe that. Uh, on the issue of democracy, well, we're a representative democracy. The Constitution says the people delegate their decision making to the parliament. Um, and uh, frankly, I mean, if we were to have, I mean, well, look at the, look at the places that in fact have, uh, have referenda on everything. I mean, one is California, the other one is Switzerland, and, uh, and they're paralyzed countries. I mean, that's why, I mean, they, uh, and uh, on top of that, half the referenda are not about what they're about. I mean, let us recall the, uh, the treaty, I mean, the referendum on the Constitution in France. It was not about the Constitution, it was about the services directive. So people were voting yes or no based on the service directive, not on the, not on... They voted on Turkey. And Poland. And Poland, yeah, the, the, the Polish plumber. Yeah, but I mean, so, I mean, do you think, is it democratic? Well, I mean, yes, it is, that, that's what we have, dem uh, we have, representative democracy for. I mean, if we're going to say, well, you know, I mean, do they have a right to do that? Well, then let's forget parliaments. And that's, I, mean, I don't think that's anything we want. You know, we're after all invented for people to be represented and for the parliament to take the heat as well, because they make the tough decisions. Um, I mean, that's how you, uh, <laughs> I mean, you, you, otherwise you would never pass populism. And if you look at sort of the behavior of the, both the uh, 
Athenian parliament as well as the, the Roman Senate. I mean, basically, public opinion goes one way or another. I mean, you, you banish someone, you chop off their head, and then later on they say, oops, we shouldn't have done that. Uh, that's why we, I mean, you know, a representative democracy is the way to go. But, and the risks taken by the representative, uh, representatives, the elected, del uh, elected parliamentarians, is that, well, when comes election time, they may come and haunt them. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Maybe I, mean, it will. I mean, we don't know. I mean, we did have a government that was re-elected after, after, sort of after the crisis, uh, I mean, having taken very tough measures. So I guess, you know, the, the people supported the policies. But nonetheless, I mean, that doesn't, uh, I mean, the, the issue is then, I mean, still public support uh, may not come out against the parliament. Public support may wane, however, for the European Union. Juliana, do you want to come back on that? Well, uh, I, do, I don't intend to solve all of the Greek problems uh, from Brussels. It's not my problem. So you are absolutely right. Uh, can I remedy corruption in Greece from Brussels? No, I can't. What I have in mind is disentangling the destiny of the euro, my currency, from corruption in Greece. This is my aim. This is what I have in mind in making not all of the national policies single European ones. It would be a nonsense and also a disaster. But giving, and this is, I understand the difficulty, the European level, the necessary competencies to uh, 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 counterweight uh, asymmetric shocks and uh, a budget sufficiently thick, this is the real difficulty, as to uh, support the euro. A European treasury with European bonds linked to European activities. I, I'm not thinking of euro bonds. Euro bonds is the wrong solution in my view. Because euro bonds is the peak of intergovernmentalism, mutualizing debts. I mean, it's, it's not this. If I have euro bonds, it has to be for federal debts if needed, for federal activities if needed, not for. But this is, this is the point. Uh, uh, what makes the euro weak is that the currency is single and the bonds in the market that gives a value to this currency are 17 countries' bonds. It, this is what can't work. So can we envisage a fiscal capacity of the union and a currency that is there linked to that fiscal capacity? Until three months ago, I thought that this was my dream. Uh, something that I think is badly needed, but unhappily is a dream. And we know that frequently in history what is needed is impossible. And therefore, uh, uh, what happens uh, is something else. But for the first time, the notion of European fiscal capacity appears in the interim report of the uh, uh, Van Rompuy uh, uh, group working uh, toward the genuine uh, monetary banking, uh, etc. union. And they are precisely hinting at what is needed. So, uh, my opinion is that uh, this idea that we should uh, uh, anchor the euro to uh, our European level and make our member states more directly responsible for their destinies, it's a trade-off. 
We wanted the intergovernmental coordination in 92 to preserve national freedom, let us put it this way. Now we realize that national freedom is even narrower uh, than it would be with a different system, and we can build upon it uh, if possible. Otherwise, the risk is high. Marco, if you don't keep the microphone too close to your mouth, it's better. Okay, is this fine now? Don't keep it too close. Okay. Um, so... Ah, no, it's not Marco to go back, speaking. To go back to the public opinion... If, um, if you could just, just introduce yes. yourself briefly. Yes, yes. Yerje Mavrodi, researcher at the Robert Schumann Center of Advanced Studies. Um, to go back to the public opinion issue during the crisis, um, I have the impression, the more I talk to people here at the UI and elsewhere, that one of the problems facing, that we face during this crisis, is the problem of short memory uh, in debates, not only in public opinion debates, but also among politicians. Um, I'll be the first to say that Greeks, the Greek public opinion is the first one to suffer from short memory when people talk about Europe. They have uh, very easily forgotten all the years, the good, the good years, so to speak, of participating in the EU with all the funds that were uh, coming from Brussels for lots of infrastructural uh, programs. But I'm sorry to say that I detect a kind of short memory in the, in the comments of the Mr. President as well. Um, Estonia, as part of the um, enlargement round in 2004, uh, was also a receiver of EU funds, right? Um, back then, also, there were peoples in Europe that they were just also getting um, some money out of their pockets through their taxes to support enlargement. In both cases, and this is my point here, in both cases, during this crisis, in the enlargement process, the underlying philosophy was that we need to support, we need to help in order to have a bigger Europe or better Europe or a functioning Europe in order to secure what long-term memory shows us that existed as, as goals, peace and prosperity and cooperation. And I think one of the challenges of the current crisis is not to, to focus on the crisis itself right now, but to keep remembering why we are in this project in the first place. Maybe this will help us explain in our countries, public opinions, and also may help, may help the negotiators um, at the EU level as well move forward and get over the crisis itself. Thank you. Marco Meyer from the University of Florence. Uh, I have uh, just two short questions. First question, I feel that the European leaders uh, should cope uh, with the basic issues, the basic issue, which is uh, f uh, freedom and fear. I remember that after the Berlin Wall, in the new free countries, the basic instinct was, let's join the NATO. This is what really the basic instinct, at least in my experience. Now that I feel there is something similar, because what is needed is to stop Euro Europe to be challenged by the rest of the world. That's why Draghi is right when he wants to be, let's say, the commander in chief. This, so the question is, why the European le leaders don't join Mario Draghi, a position in, you have, or why don't they join Mario Draghi position? Second question is this. I think that uh, uh, the question of uh, the democratic deficit should be related to the forthcoming European elections. And the only way to get 
as Giuliano Amato was saying, a fiscal policy, which means European tax, I mean, European citizens paying some taxes, could be the election of a European president. And in my view, it could be the president of the European Council, which it should, might be easier than the European Commission. All right, let me take that in order. Um, first of all, don't ascribe the woman. Uh, don't ascribe to me views that uh, are not mine. I mean, I go around telling people all the time that look, people, if you look at what you've gotten from the EU, then grumbling about this is really pointless because we've gotten so much from the EU. So it's not my position. I mean, don't ascribe to me that. And that's, in fact, I mean, that's what I go around telling people. So that's. Uh, so, I mean, I have no problem with memory. What does make it a little more difficult, of course, is the rather obnoxious position of some people who, uh, um, I mean, the, the persistence of the category of old and new member states. Um, I remember reading, in, in fact, one of the, re I wrote an essay on this. Uh, you can find, it's the April-May issue of Policy Review. The article is called, I'll Pay You Tuesday, which comes from the Popeye cartoon, if you know that. Um, but the, I was uh, driven to write that by Jean, I don't know what his second name is, but, but his name is Piris. He was, he was the head of the legal services uh, and so, a so-called architect of Europe. And he said that the entire problem is caused by the enlargement to the East. If we didn't have the enlargement to the East, we would have no problems in the European Union. Now, mm, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I mean, so when you say the people have, I mean, when you talk, well, it was the Eastern, the 2004 uh, enlargement, which is the root of all evil. Um, now, I mean, here, I mean, I guess what I would say that you, where you do get a fair bit of resentment which is not to do with bailing out countries richer than we are, but you're doing the right thing and you're still considered a second-class country by those who are not doing the right things and who are ignoring their laws. I mean, that, that is what is irksome. And I think that is what sometimes affects uh, attitudes in these countries, which is that, you know, we're doing our best to be good. Uh, now, and the other thing which, uh, what was the second, the second question was on? was also about direct, it was the idea of direct elections. Oh, okay. Elections. Basically, I would say if you do direct elections to the, uh, to the European Union without a change in the electoral procedure, but do popular elections, you are, will kill the European Union, and the European Union will consist of five, maybe six large countries. Because you will never have a president who is not either German or French. And uh, in that case, unless they're Luxembourgian, because the French and the Germans have agreed that it should be Jean-Claude Juncker who is the <laughs> president. But otherwise, I mean, so a direct popular elections without a different elect, I mean, you cannot have direct popular elections in the EU given the differences in the size and the populations of the countries. Uh, you may think so if you're one of the big six, but you won't have anyone else with you after that. No, uh, no I, I have nothing to add. I have nothing to add. I, I simply notice that uh, Marco uh, take note of this, that there is something that is considered almost obvious in the big countries, that, of course, if we want more democracy, why don't we elect somebody at the European level? But uh, a small country might uh, look at this matter differently. And so, uh, without something uh, uh, Madisonian, uh, 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 you know, uh, the views are, are, are different because if you read uh, uh, the, uh, 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 what Bob Dahl has written on his country, you think it is not a democratic country also because of this reason, because there was that initial compromise that gave small and big states to senators independently of their population. Well, from the angle of the small states, this is 
more democratic than something else precisely for the same reason and we have to cope with both views. I could add to this though, I thought we'd discuss this later, but basically, um, I mean, unless you have a bicameral parliament where one, uh, one body is elected popularly, the other one is uh, equal representation of states, um, it's not going to work. I mean, I mean, in the European Parliament today, one Estonian is worth 16 Germans. I mean, I'm surprised the Germans are not up in arms. I mean, I mean it's, it's very nice if you're Estonian to be worth 16 Germans, but I mean, if you look at the uh, proportion of representation, it's not a very wise way of doing it's things. Regressive proportionality. Yeah. <laughs> so we go. Okay. You want to go on to your All right. Well, I thought, I mean, the other thing which I, I mean, there are two other topics which I thought we discussed, but um, especially if you, re, if you don't read anything longer than 140 characters, then you might know something about Estonia and regarding the discussion uh, on austerity versus growth, uh, which is like another big theme. Um, and unfortunately, Estonia has, uh, has become, oddly enough, I would argue, uh, one of many political footballs in a battle, in uh, internal battle of U.S. policy, but, or the U.S. elections, but in any case, uh, we have become the poster boy or the uh, or the dartboard, depending on your point of view, of uh, this whole debate that is also extended now to Europe on austerity versus growth. Um, and I just thought I sort of talk about some of the issues we face because, uh, first of all, people forget that we had any choice in the matter. I mean, Estonia did not adopt an austerity program because we're such Calvinists that we think it's a good idea. Um, uh, I mean, basically, we basically we had no choice because we had, we had the real estate market collapsed uh, right before the Lehman collapse, and there we were. I mean, with just I mean, we were not getting any tax receipts any, anymore. And so, what do you do in that situation? Well, if you're not a member of the euro and you're having you're in a deep economic crisis, then you also don't go to the banks or to I mean the bond market and get anything at any sustainable rate. So, I mean, you cannot borrow from abroad, or if you do, you'll go even more bankrupt because the rates are so high, and you don't have the tax revenue. So, the sort of fairly obvious thing to do is you cut. Okay, I mean, not much choice in that matter, uh, but then what offends people is that we actually, as a result of not only cutting the budget, but actually doing a number of uh, liberalizing reforms on the labor market, we actually fairly quickly uh, started having growth again. So last year we had 8.3% GDP growth. Uh, this year it's down to 2.2, but IMF and, uh, the, and the Commission predict next year 3.6% uh, growth. Um, so, I mean, of course, this, this offends the people who want to make a more Keynesian argument. I don't think it's Keynes. It's just that we, did, we couldn't borrow to stimulate our economy. We just had to do what we had to do, to quote uh, Rocky. And so, um, there we were, and it, it did work. Uh, and because some people have used this to promote the fact that, see, austerity is a good idea, and then sort of other people who write for the New York Times seem to think that this is really bad, leading people to cherry pick data and make arguments that, well, first of all, I mean, we can have this intellectual debate, but at least what has offended us is that we have become sort of, and people just nasty toward us and snide about Estonia, and we don't see it that we deserve it. Um, but just to explain, I mean, what, why it, it was that Estonia, I mean, who was also offered, uh, I mean, told by people to devalue. That's the way out. You're not a member of the euro yet, uh, so devalue your currency. Um, and again, fairly not, not really thinking about the situation, just dispensing free advice is that um, we basically, this would have not really helped either because if we're a, if you're an exporting country, most of the raw material, um, the, what you buy in with the euro, what you're going to then process, and then you sell it out. Now, if you devalue, it doesn't give you any benefit because you buy more expensive and then you sell more cheaply. It doesn't really work. 
Uh, and of course, the real thing that we were threatened with is that since, I mean, in the condition that we poor East Europeans are in, uh, if you wanted to borrow money to buy a house or an apartment, you had to borrow in euros. I mean, in some countries it's Swiss francs, in our country it was in euros. So there we had uh, sort of a, a homeowner class that has developed over the past 20 years. Um, the most enterprising people who actually believe in their country take risks and say, I'm going to buy my own house or my own apartment, would have been wiped out. Because if you have an effective devaluation, 30 to 50 percent, all those people are going to lose their homes. And we cannot afford to have our most sort of active, broad-based population, and not the 1 percent, but the general population, lose their homes. So we couldn't devalue, so that didn't give us any benefit. We couldn't borrow. So there was no other option but austerity, which, well, anyway, because there is this big debate, um, and I would argue, looking from our own experiences, of course, is that the people who, who sort of cast the argument in terms of austerity versus growth are creating a completely false dichotomy. It is not whether you can the one people say, don't borrow, the other people say, borrow, stimulate the economy. I mean, that makes, I think, a fatal assumption of the way the EU runs right now, which is that we have to keep things the way they are, which is the kind of protectionist system that we have in which uh, we don't have free movement of services, really. I mean, it's, uh, we have a sort of fake free movement of services in the EU because real services don't move. For a country like mine, especially, the um, Telecommunications doesn't even come under the services directive, whereas, uh, I mean, it should, I think. Um, the common agricultural pro uh, policy, which we have today, is a complete and utter distortion of the internal market. I mean, most obscenely so, because, I mean, basically across the EU, tractors cost the same, diesel costs the same, seeds, fuel, well, I mentioned fuel, uh, pesticides, Everything costs the same, whether you're in Estonia, you're in France, or you're in Latvia, or in Italy, same thing. But the differential between direct payments is minimally threefold between what the direct payments that an Estonian farmer gets and an Italian farmer gets. And in the case, I mean, if you look at uh, Denmark and the Netherlands out of some kind of grandfather clause, it's a six-fold difference. Now, that is not a functioning internal market. There is no competition when one person or one farmer is getting six times the amount of money that the other one. In fact, if you do the calculations, there's no point in any of us farming at all because all the money is already made by the people even I mean, they've already made a profit even before they, uh, we start sort of looking at our expenses. The internal market is incomplete, does not work, and if you don't make it work, you're not going to be generating any income if you're not going to have competition. Um, and, if, and I'll just give you just a short sort of true story about my experience with the lack of an internal market. In 2003, I moved from one apartment to another in Tallinn, our capital. I called up my internet service provider. I said, hello, I moved. I need a new internet connection. And they said, well, we can come at 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, or 4.30. What would you like? We have competition in ISPs. Then I was elected to the European Parliament. I rented an apartment. The owner of the apartment, the landlord, said, well, if there's some problems with the bureaucracy or something, just give me a call because, no, you know, you're not familiar with this. Anyway, so I applied for an internet connection. I, seven weeks went by and there was no response. There only are two ISPs. There's this Belga Common Corita. So I called my landlord and I said, I can't get an internet connection. I come home every night at 11 because I have to sit in my office because there's no... And, they and, uh, and, and then my landlord said to me, but it's only seven weeks. <laughs> now, I mean, I think that if we're, going, we're talking about the Lisbon strategy or agenda or whichever it is that we're going to make Europe the most competitive economy in the world, well, you're not going to get there by having the kind of closed closed system that we have today. So I would argue that if in, when it comes to the growth versus uh, austerity debate, we forget those two terms. You can get growth with austerity. You can get growth 
by borrowing, you can get growth, but I would argue the way to get sensible growth is by actually uh, eliminating the current uh, barriers within the uh, internal market. <laughs> no, of course, uh, austerity versus growth is the uh, typical kind of ideological debate that, in my view, doesn't make great sense uh, unless you want to be ideological and therefore support one view uh, against the other. Uh, not only Thomas, but uh, let's say I remember <coughs> Pascal Lamy who is culturally different from you, uh, when he was given, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we are different, uh, 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 when he was given a honorary degree, I think in Bruges some months ago, it was July, he, he delivered a lecture, a speech, in which he defined this uh, uh, dilemma as stupid. Uh, he used the word stupid because he says it's not austerity versus growth, it's uh, sound policies versus unsound policies. And uh, you may be sound doing both, you may be unsound doing one of the two ones. And, and I think that he was perfectly correct, adding that, of course, it also depends on your starting point and therefore on what austerity means for you because austerity means in principle fiscal discipline, budgetary discipline. Now you can't say that budgetary discipline is not needed for growth because it's a prerequisite for whatever sound policy you want to do. Without fiscal discipline, you are wasting your resources and you are producing side effects that might become negative externalities on your growth. There are countries that are thought to be uh, in principle against discipline in Europe. I have to tell you something that uh, I, I, I was taking part in a conference in Paris uh, uh, some months ago and we were discussing these sort of things and when it was my turn to speak I don't remember exactly what I said but certainly I used the, the word discipline clearly uh, uh, not as a negative notion. Uh, then we had lunch there and uh, somebody came over, uh, uh, touching upon my shoulder, and said, I uh, want to, uh, 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 let's say, congratulate you because I liked what you said. He was a German. He was German. And he said, you are Italian and you use the word discipline. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> It was a sort of mixed feeling uh, <laughs> that uh, I felt in myself, but I, I, I understood the sense uh, of his reaction. Certainly, it, it would have been the same had I been uh, Greek, uh, I, uh, I imagine. But again, if it is fiscal discipline, it has to be such, full stop. Uh, starting from a huge debt, uh, uh, austerity means heavy financial readjustment and it means something necessarily different at this stage. Uh, aiming at fiscal discipline but uh, 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 producing effects in terms of financial readjustments that might penalize growth. That's the point, directly. So everybody knows that from a starting point of uh, public debt, financial readjustment measures produce a downturn in your economy for several reasons. First of all, because public expenditure is salaries. First of all, reducing salaries, you reduce your demand and therefore, again, your production is, is affected because investments, public investments that might be needed because your industrial system, your services, 
places need infrastructures that remain there and that uh, are not adding their value to your real economy. Because your banking system, and this is what we have experienced in these years, might be completely, uh, uh, let's say, if not destroyed, distorted in, in its activity, any bank of a country with a huge public debt will be under pressure to buy treasury bonds of the country itself. At that point, if the markets think that the bonds of that country are risky, nobody will lend money to that bank. One of the consequences, unwanted consequences, of our financial readjustments, public bonds to be bought, etc., etc., has been the disruption of the interbanking market inside the Eurozone. And therefore, there is no interbanking lending, and there is no lending from the banks uh, to uh, private companies, which again reduces uh, uh, e e economic activities, plus the uh, weight of the spread on private activities. Because what people not necessarily know is that if there is a spread between, let's say, the German bank benchmark and your treasury bonds, your banks, your private companies, when they need money, when they need an insurance, whatever they need, they pay this uh, plus of the spread which makes them less competitive vis-a-vis -vis their competitors of other European countries. So there are, uh, uh, let's say, counteractions, antidotes that are needed in this case. And in, in these terms, if the antidotes are not adopted, you might find austerity versus growth. So the problem is not to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, abandon financial readjustment, but to be active in introducing the necessary antidotes in the economies, which is something that at the European level should be done more easily than at the national level, quite clearly. Because if uh, 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 my national budget has to be brought down, downsized to uh, reduce the debt, uh, I can't find there the resources that I need to uh, uh, counterbalance. While, of course, you need for the banking system what is being done now, what the European Central Bank is doing plus the uh, banking union. So, I mean, these things have to be done and go beyond Thomas' liberalization, not against, but beyond liberalization. And liberalization is needed because you were saying that prices are the same, but uh, still now, we have crucial areas for our common growth where national fragmentation is still, is still where it was. I remember uh, days ago, the uh, uh, vice president of Nokia telling us that if he wants, if they want to introduce a new service with their gadgets throughout the common market, they still need 27 licenses, mm -hmm. not one. I mean, the uh, European market is one. Nokia is there, is a European company. And for people staying like this with their uh, 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 telephone, mo mobile, is something that makes no difference at all. 27 licenses still now. And we don't have the smart grid for our uh, uh, electricity, et cetera, et cetera. So you are, you, you are right with, with that. But there is something more.
at uh, Velo Petta University of Tartu, I may try a surreptitious move back to the future of Europe issue um, because I want to take advantage of the two gentlemen standing here, one is a former MEP and one is indeed the, the Vice Chairman of the Convention, to ask the, the sort of big question, where, where will we find or how will we generate the political men momentum to find this, and in what form will we have some kind of new forum where we will have this big European discussion, be it federalism, be it whatever else. Um, because clearly we've tried them, I think, all already. The IGCs, the, the, the auspicious conventions. We now seem to be talking here and there about European Parliament elections, um, but that's not a forum, that's a momentary kind of uh, set of elections. So, you know, what will you push for as president and what are your reflections as having been uh, in, eminently involved with one of those forms of European um, uh, concertation? What forms do we have left? Where do we go? Or is it... Let me answer quickly, very quickly. That's what was going to, that is going to be the third section of our, 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 our battle here. <laughs>
Uh, I mean, we see Germany coming up with an election in less than a year. So, I mean, I think that there, you know, this is true of any country. I mean, you know, uh, you do, the hard and fast rule of politics is the right after the election is where you do all the difficult, <coughs> courageous things, and then you hope that everyone forgets by the time you get to the next election. So, I think we're smarter, but that doesn't mean we're going to move faster. Yeah. Well, I thought, I mean, I thought that we'd just talk a little bit about uh, democratic legitimacy here and how we, I mean, what are the sort of the way we structure the European Union and for the future. Uh, and uh, it's a very difficult thing to do because there are certain words, one of them you mentioned discipline, which has very, very different interpretations. Uh, another word which we know very well has, has opposite meanings depending on where you're sitting, uh, the word liberal. Uh, I mean, what is a liberal in, in Europe? <laughs> what is a liberal, what is the definition of liberal in Europe? I mean, even within Europe, I mean, you have two kinds of liberals. I mean, you have the FDP, an R, an Estonian kind of liberal, and then you have, you know, say, the UK liberals. I mean, they're very different positions, um, not to mention the American definition of liberal. So, and then there's the F word, which I don't, I'm not going to utter, because I think the understanding of the F word is so bizarre uh, in Europe, and, uh, and like the word liberal, means it's opposite. But, but I think that uh, perhaps the best thing to do actually is to look at the problem that we need to solve precisely, which is really the problem of the, of the large and the small and how to keep both happy. Um, and I think that, um, well, I won't mention matters and he went to the University of Virginia, but two graduates of Columbia College, uh, which I graduated, uh, John Jay and Alexander Hamilton uh, dealt with this exactly this problem. There would not have been a functioning United States without a resolution of the problem of the little ones and the big ones, and how do you get them to agree to be in the same, the same political entity without it falling apart? I mean, after all, previous to the, uh, to the uh, Constitution, there were Articles of Confederation, and the Articles of Confederation fell apart in just a matter of years because you had the problem of small versus large and the respecting the rights of the small, but at the same time taking into account the interests of the large. Um, so, I mean, I think let's not use any words to define this because it just causes really ridiculous reactions. Um, I mean, even raising the issue, I think, sometimes creates uh, ridiculous reactions. But in any case, we, that I think is the, uh, and if we really look at where we want to go, um, we have to resolve this issue in the European Union. When we resolve that, we avoid discussions such as we ought to have pan-European presidential elections, because we, at least popular elections, because that's a fa going to be a failure. Well, we, you know, to the small ones. Well, I mean, that's one way of saying you can only come from a country that has fewer than 1.3 million people. That would be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you <laughs> can, uh, but from that, I mean, as, uh, as Giuliano will probably expound upon because he knows, thinks about this much more than I have the opportunity to do about what, what, that, what the implications are of a restructuring of the political process and the, in uh, the EU will mean for even finances. I mean, the California versus, uh, versus America debt problem. So anyway, I that, this might be just something where we just, oops, discuss, all of us. Do you want to come in? Yes, uh, 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 I deeply agree <laughs> with you, Thomas, because uh, I, I'm convinced, that, and I have said it today repeatedly, that we have, uh, and I'm using a forbidden word, federalizing, which shouldn't be pronounced because uh, it creates uh, an immediate kind of wariness, uh, if not hostility. But I keep saying it because I want to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 it to be accepted that we have such an ugly Europe 
that even federalizing it might be better than remaining where we are. So if you don't love Spinelli or Schumann, at least you might be ready to understand and to accept my arguments. But this federalization I have in mind does not, uh, let's say, destroy the basic, the real Grundnorm of legitimacy in our union that is a dual legitimacy. We wrote it, you remember, in the text of the Constitutional Treaty that uh, the legitimacy of the European Union is based on the will of its states and on the will of its citizens, which does not really mean states and citizens. It's uh, one, it, one way or another, it refers to uh, multiple identities that we have in ourselves, due to which there are issues and matters in relation to which we want to be represented as European citizens, but there are other matters on which we feel we have our national identity. And these two has to be represented in the overall system. Perhaps the Treaty of Lisbon has gone even too far in uh, 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 preserving national identities uh, and Article 4 could have been written with some more, uh, let's say, lightness. Uh, uh, the German Bundesverfassungsgericht could use it quite heavily and rightly, I can't object, because on the basis of Article 4, they simply said what you can draw out of it, nothing beyond it. But this is uh, marginal at this point. The basic point is that uh, a, a democratic European Union should reflect both my European and my national identities. Otherwise, it would not be democratic. And therefore, there is something simplistic when we say that for, in order for Europe to be more democratic, there should be more European things. Not only that. In order to be democratic, it, it has to be both, because, I mean, uh, I was quoting Bob Dole. Bob Dole is right when, when he says that democracy has, first of all, a smaller level than the big ones where, uh, where we have to fight and to defend ourselves. But uh, um, uh, the multi-tier uh, uh, identities is, is part of the uh, democratic uh, organization of Europe. Therefore, there might be solutions uh, different from the American one, from the Senate uh, to, 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 to independently of the size of population, but certainly we need the two-chamber system, one of them representing the states, one of them representing the citizens, and we are close to it. We are close to it. Our problem is that in our uh, Sovietic system, uh, the council is both uh, the legislative and the executive power, uh, a sort of presidium uh, 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 of our union, but I mean, it, it, can, be, it, it can be changed in the future. Uh, I would go to uh, the question uh, when the necessary momentum to deal seriously to this thing and not, uh, uh, let's say, words uh, 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 in, uh, in a cloister uh, that might remain there uh, uh, part of this uh, special atmosphere. Uh, 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 I, have, I have this in mind. Uh, 
the uh, parliamentary elections of 2013 as a sort of divide. Before the elections, it is mostly a responsibility of political parties at the European level and throughout Europe to create this momentum because there will be a, a campaign. And the first issue in this campaign will be what kind of Europe do you want? And do you still want a European Union? Do you still want a common, a single currency? And what have we to do to uh, improve, uh, et cetera, et cetera? So this is the typical political responsibility. Difficult for our parties because, of course, they will be uh, uh, facing uh, uh, an initial hostility of their electors, but they have the opportunity to demonstrate that more Europe is a different Europe and it can be better. It can be better. Uh, as Maris was saying, I don't want to give you more of the same. We need more for it not to be the same, because the same is uh, worse and worse. After the European elections, I might be a conservative, but I expect the uh, next European Parliament uh, to uh, uh, promote a, a new convention. And this convention should be bold enough as to convince Germany, where several Germans are already convinced, that of course the Bundesverfassung Gericht has said things that we have to share. That there are modifications beyond the threshold and being these modifications beyond the threshold, not only the European treaty, but also national constitutions will have to be changed. Right. I spoke to several judges of the Bundesverfassung Gericht, and their position was, we don't want to veto anything. We are simply warning our fellow citizens that if they want to go beyond the existing compromise, also their national constitution is affected and they have to change it. I think that they are right. Because between the kind of hermaphrodite, as I call it, of the current European Union and the federal Europe, there is really a, a, a sort of cleavage. And we go beyond that cleavage. We have to change also our... Will it be possible? I don't know. What I only know is that it's perhaps necessary. Thank you, Juliana. We're going to have to, to, to stop, so I'm going to give President Ilves the last word, if you want, to oh, make a couple people. of... Uh, yes, I, do. Well, I finally found something to... with which to disagree with, or at least... Le uh, thinking about uh, the, the discussion on preservation of national identity during the uh, convention discussion, it has become clear, I think, to, to at least some of us, that that national identity, I think people thought in folkloric or culinary or linguistic terms, but it turns out to have to do with discipline. <laughs> and there's a, I mean, I think what your example of the German coming to you said, I'm surprised you support, I mean, that has become national, the dominant of national identity, uh, rather than, you know, what you eat, you know, do you prefer pasta or do you prefer uh, cold herring uh, like we do? Um, but rather, these attitudes. And now the question is, if our national identity is determined by our attitude towards fiscal responsibility, mm. and we have to, in, within the European Union, respect everyone's national identity, then we're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the second thing I want to say, I mean, to uh, Professor Pettai's question of how do we proceed, I mean, I'll, I'll actually throw something out which is quite... I agree with you. I, I like this argument. <laughs> <laughs> uh, i just throw this out. I mean, I just... Uh, that I, I think that when I recall the discussions uh, in leading up to the convention, um, uh, it was basically, uh, I actually, in my country, at least, the citizen did not really participate. It was, there were different politicians who, for whatever domestic political reasons, adopted different positions, and, uh, and that was the debate. 
and I'm, I'm actually very impressed by something that has been pioneered by a Stanford professor named James Fishkin, and it's the process of deliberative democracy, which basically you get people to come together, not just the politicians, but in fact citizens, to actually discuss these issues. And then sort of, and, I mean, his fine- remember we were together in an exercise. Uh, uh, yes, yes, we were on, on uh, yeah, I mean, this was- It was before the last elections. Yes. And I was via Skype yeah, or something. Yeah, via Skype. Uh, but I mean, I think we need to, if we're really going to proceed with this, uh, we have to find some mechanism by which to include the citizens in the discussion as well. So it's not, it's not that, oh, those three or four politicians on that side are in that position, and those three or four on that side, and then they argue back and forth, which may, all may be very interesting to them, but, uh, but in fact, we need, I mean, because I think that unless you, the citizen experiences being, the, has the experience of being brought into the European discussion, the European debate, um, through some mechanism, such as Fishkin's, uh, well, I mean, he's just, uh, he has developed a nice mechanism for it, uh, then it's going to be another sort of elite project that we have, that, that has nothing to do with the people, as it were, to take the populist line. But I think that's one way of doing it. But anyway, we need whatever the sine qua non for an effective discussion of where we go is to actually do it in a way that the citizens are brought into the discussion and actually discuss. It's not a matter of having, you know, bringing famous people from outside the country to talk to a town hall in your own country and then just talk, but rather to get the discussion going. Great. Thank you very much. Well, looking at my watch, I think we should bring that to an end, though I'm tempted to carry on. Um, can I thank very much both our participants, uh, Thomas Ilves and Giuliano Amato, uh, for a, stimulating a very good discussion, I think, and, and raising, not being afraid to ask some of the hard questions, but also offering a few answers to some of the hard questions as well. Thank you very much to both of you.